Hello and welcome to today's webinar. This is Dan Klimke from NetAlly, and joining me today is Blake Crone, and we're going to get into talking about real-world access layer Ethernet troubleshooting uh, with LinkRunner G2. Uh, let's go, to the, go ahead and go to the next slide there, Blake. So today's presenter is Blake Crone. Blake is a mobility consultant. Uh, and is the founder and managing director of a company called Mobia Droit. Blake is an industry recognized subject matter expert, consultant, and trainer. Uh, he focuses on mobility solutions, creating highly scalable networks and integrations, as well as developing the future generations of mobility engineers and architects in his role as a trainer. Blake has been working with wireless technologies since 1999 and has extensive experience in many markets, having done designs for some of the largest networks in the world. Blake, uh, welcome. You, you seem to be a big fan of certifications. Uh, I see a number of impressive, impressive ones, including CCIE and CCNP for wireless, uh, CCNA for security, wireless, voice, routing and switching, CWNE, CWAP. My goodness. Uh, so we welcome you and your uh, expertise to today's webinar. Thanks, Dan. Glad to be here. And yeah, knowledge is, knowledge is important, so. All right, so let's get into it. Um, our, I'm, we're having a little bit of difficulty getting the right visual going, but I think we're okay. Or does it look okay on your end, Blake? Yep, it looks okay. All for right. Your, yes, you. All right, good, thanks. So uh, just a couple of logistics before we move forward. Uh, common question, yes, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will send you a follow-up email with a link. Um, it will take a couple of days to get this posted onto the NetAlly website, and you see the URL there. It can also be accessed by uh, going to the um, uh, webinars link in the uh, top nav of the uh, webcast. Uh, be sure to ask questions along the way. If you have any questions, please use the questions tab in the GoToWebinar user interface. Uh, if I can answer them immediately, I will, uh, or I might interject with Blake and have him answer right away. or we hope to have some time at the end where we can also answer those questions there. With that, Blake, I'll turn it over to you. Go ahead. All right, thanks, Dan. So yeah, what we're gonna be talking about here today, uh, like Dan mentioned, was we're gonna be looking at a wired port testing and kind of focusing on this and wrapping this around an actual scenario. So we're gonna walk through a scenario that we see many times when we're deploying, say for example, wireless equipment and how we can leverage the Link Runner G2. And I'm also gonna have a Etherscope NXG at one point in time, just because I want you to be able to see both screens at the same time of what we're working on here. But we're gonna walk through this as a scenario of, of what we see commonly out there and how you can leverage the tools, like I said, of, of the handhelds to be able to do this testing and verification that your port is ready to go. So here you can see our scenario that we're gonna work through today. The scenario is, is pretty basic and pretty straightforward if you've ever deployed wireless networks. So we're saying that this is a mock, brand new Cisco wireless deployment. Uh, we're trying to validate that it's ready to go, that our APs are gonna be able to turn up and everything. And you can see here that we're using a Cisco Catalyst 9130AX access point. And you'll see later on why this little detail, it might seem like it's a little, but why this little detail is very important. And we've got a couple of things that in order to bring up an access point, these are controller-based access points. So one of the things that we have to worry about is how does the access point figure out how to get to the controller? And there's a trick that we can use with DHCP options, DHCP option 60 and option 43 in combination. It's where it's gonna say, hey, I'm an access point, send me some options. Here's the option, and this option is gonna be the particular one for the wireless LAN controller's address. And we also need to make sure that we have 802.3 BT UPOE, which is what we saw when we read the data sheet for this particular access point. So that's what it's gonna to take to bring this access point up. Now there's some network pieces of it as well that we wanna be able to verify and validate that are correct that we're looking for. We're looking for this device to be on VLAN 110. We're looking for it to get an address then in 192.168.110.0 slash 24. And we have a specific DHCP server that it's supposed to be getting its address from. This is important because that's the DHCP server that is set up and configured to be able to do the DHCP options that we need in order for this to work. So what is our problem that we're facing right now? The AP isn't joining the controller. 
right now at this point in time, the AP is not coming up. Uh, if you ever work with Cisco APs, it's just doing the LED dance because it can't find the controller. Something's going on. We don't know exactly what is the problem that's going on there. So what we're going to do here is we're going to switch over now to the handhelds and we're going to kind of walk through some of the tests that you can do with the Link Runner G2. And this is the same for any of the uh, wired testers from NetAlley as well. But we're going to walk through what are the different tests that we can do to figure out what's going on in troubleshoot and how this relates to this process of validating and turning up this network. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to switch over to our uh, handheld devices here real quick. So we've got our handheld device here, and you can see that this is real time here. We've got the device and everything that's shown here. And just so that we remember what our scenario is, let's put the scenario up there so that you can all see the scenario again as we go through this. So Dan, the first thing that we're gonna look at here is we've got a report from the cable installers that says all these cables have been tested. They've all been verified. They're all ready to go. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're just going to fire off a auto test. So an auto test on the Link Runner G2 here, all we do is repress the little NetILI symbol in the dock, and that's going to bring up our auto test, and it's going to start running through some various tests about this port. So as it's doing this here, we're going to look and we're going to see things like PoE. We're going to see what switch port interface it's connected to. We're going to see, does it get an IP address? Does it reach DNS? All these different tests are going to be ran here. Add the curse of the demo gods here. Oh, hey, guess what? Physical layer one. Dan, as we were switching things around here, I forget to chug, plug in the cable. So that always helps too. <laughs> so we'll plug in our cable here and it's gonna go through and now it's gonna link up. I heard the relays click over. So it's gonna start run, running through the test there. And we're gonna go through this process of trying to get these results of what's going on. You see, we got our flashy links here, our, our physical layer one here, we get blinky lights. All right, now we got our results coming in. Anything stand out as wrong with this right now? Well, I, I would say that uh, we're linked at a speed lower than we should be. Yeah, but didn't our, didn't our cable tech say that they checked this cable out and, and everything was good? But we can drill in this, we can look at this and see. So the advertised speed is 100, 1000, which is great. We want a gig speed because we're deploying an AX access point. So we want to be able to have that throughput on the back end. But the actual speed that we actually got was only 100 meg. What's going on with this? So what we can do here is we look at this result and we know that there's something that's gotta be wrong here. So we gotta start looking at our, our cable and we gotta start looking at and trying to figure out and understand what's going on with this cable. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna disconnect it from the switch port down here. And we're gonna switch over to the cable here and we're gonna run an unterminated test on this. Right there, you can see that we've got an open in our cable. If we were to run this as terminated as well here, I'm gonna switch this again real quick. So you can see here, we've got that open pair down on seven and eight. With that open pair on seven and eight, the problem that we run into is this cable might have tested fine at one point. There might be just a issue with the crimp, for example. In this case, I actually completely hosed this cable and snipped pins seven and eight so they weren't even working. But you can imagine this as being an improperly terminated cable where, like I said, just one of the, you know, the cables pushed in, but it didn't get fully seated. So then when you crimped down the pins, it didn't actually make contact with anything, or maybe it did make enough contact that just with the wiggling back and forth, everything it was working, but then it wasn't working. So we wanna make sure that we can verify our cables are correct before we move on here, because this is a, a big issue for us. It's always important to trust and verify your cables and test them to make sure that you don't have any physical layer issues that you might be trying to look out for. So what do we do in this scenario? Well, we switch the cables and we go to a proper cable that we know is going to work. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to switch my cable to a good working cable and not trip myself as I'm doing this. There we go. And now you can see what's our link rate that we're connected at now. We're at yeah, that. Yeah, we got the full right on. So we cleared that. So we, we fixed that first issue, which was just our, our physical cable issue that we ran into. 
All right, checking out our scenario here. Let's see here what else is not entirely correct. So we got a DHCP address. We got a switch part that we're connected to here. What's that VLAN that we're on? When I drill into those details here, you can see that we are connected to my USW E8 switch, the number one switch. We're connected to the 2.5 gigabit ethernet port, number three. But our VLAN that we received was VLAN number one, default VLAN configured on the switch. Is that correct for what we're trying to do through our certification and our validation process here? Now, we look at our scenario there, we have VLAN 110 and we have a IP address in the 192.168.110.0 range that we're looking for and we did not get that. We got a 192.168.10 address on it. So now this is where you would go and you'd pull out your laptop and go over and do your configuration, switch and everything in there. But we do have the ability because this handheld device and all of the latest generations of the handheld devices from Nanolite run Android OS on them, from a wired side tester perspective, that means that we can actually load a lot of manufacturer applications onto the device itself and do the configuration directly from the handheld. So let's go ahead and let's bring up our NXG here that I have next to us here. And we know that we are on this switch, this USW Enterprise 801. We know what port we are on, again, because we have that information right there in the layer two discovery of the auto test. So I can go to my port list here. I can look for port number three. And I can see that that's configured for the LAN and I wanted it to be on the Cisco lab, which is VLAN 110. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna make that change. We're gonna give it just a second here or two to make sure that it gets pushed down from the magical cloud onto the actual switch itself. And for good measures, we are gonna do a physical disconnect. I could also just tap the refresh in the upper right corner of the test, but I wanna make sure for in fact that this completely resets this test and sees that it goes through an entire link up process again. So I've disconnected my cable, plug that cable back in and see if I gave it enough time now. There we go, we look at that. We've got our address of 110.100. So that falls into play with where we are expecting it to get that information from. Dig into here again. One thing to note, sometimes you will see, as you can see here, that it still says VLAN 1. Because we're looking at LLDP messages, we take the first LLDP message that we see, and in the case that I have that native VLAN assigned still onto this, onto this switch port, you might receive a native VLAN LLDP first, but you actually are in your correct VLAN, and that can be verified by the fact that we got our appropriate DHCP address. So we look at our DHCP address, we've got 192.168.110.100, which is correct, and look where our, our DHCP server is now this time, 192.168.130.10. As opposed to previously, it was 192.168.130.1. So we've now verified that we have our physical layer, our layer one was connected and successful. Our layer two, VLAN, successful. Our layer three, our routed network, we've got our IP address, that's successful and everything's working there. But the access point still isn't joining the controller. There's one more piece here that we need to look at, well, two more pieces technically, but there's one more piece from the IP layer that's important, and that was that DHCP option, the option 60 and the option 43. This is where using a handheld tester becomes extremely important as opposed to looking at it from a laptop. Laptops, you're not gonna be able to natively see all of these DHCP options. There are tools out there, yes, that can do this, but they're not natively there that you can easily pull this information off. I could certainly fire up Wireshark, and do packet capture and grab all this information, but I, I, I can't just quickly and easily test it. We can on the handheld tester. 
So on the handheld tester, what we're going to do is we've got these things called profiles that we can leverage with the handheld tester. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to look at a predefined profile that I created called Cisco DHCP. And let's look at the settings here real quick before that this goes through and runs on it. What I'm looking for is down here towards the bottom where we're going to look at and see DHCP option, option 150 and option 43. Option 150, or excuse me, 43 and 60. Option 150 is another good option, but that's for TFTP servers if you're doing on-premises, uh, voice deployments, uh, boot servers, things like that. So option 60, I specified in here Cisco AP C9130AX. This is what's called a vendor class identifier, a VCI. That VCI is an identifier, as such in the name, that the device sends up to the DHCP server that says, hey, do you have any more options for me? Is there some additional information I should get? Now, DHCP, generally speaking, gives us your IP address, your gateway, you know, gives you the network mask information, might get some time details on that. And we've actually got another webinar out there from NetEye on DHCP options and troubleshooting DHCP options that you can go and look at. But the option 60 is a way for us to say, do you have any privy information for me? Because we don't want to just send this wireless LAN controller address to all client devices. They don't need it. They don't need that extra extra couple of bits in the in the DHCP response frame. So what we're going to do is we're going to say is only if you get this DHCP option 60 should you re reply with an option 43 in this case, which is the IP address, and only with this specific. VCI should you send that down. This is a way where we can have, if you've got multiple different access point types in your environment, you could have some of your older legacy equipment be sent to a specific older controller, legacy controller, and your newer equipment goes to the new controller. So the VCI is set, and we're expecting that option 43 in return on it. So if I go back to my tester screen now, and it's going to rerun the test, a good, gut, or a good way to know that the handheld is re rerunning the test is you'll always hear the relay state click over for it to start going and, and doing a test again. So we can look through here again. We got our link. We're still at 10, 1,000 or 100, 1,000, which is great. That's what we wanted. You see here now look, for example, in this particular re uh, response, we got the appropriate LLDP packet that we were expecting. So we've got that VLAN 110 in there. And our DHCP is good. So now in our DHCP, we look at this and it says option 43, I received that option 43 as 192.168.130.20, which is what I was expecting to receive. That is the address of my wireless LAN controller. So now this access point should be able to find the controller without any issues. There's one last thing to test real quick. That is UPOE. You can see through all of the tests that we've done so far in this session, we've been checking PoE. You can see it through the very first auto test up there. It says that we have PoE. What type of PoE are we looking at though right now? There's different classes of PoE. And those different classes dictates how much power you can actually get or how much power you're expected to get. Now the devices, they're going to request a certain class that says, I need to operate at X wattage, or I can't operate. Your switch has to be able to support that, and it has to be able to support that in two ways. It has to be able to support that in terms of how much available wattage there is based off of pre-existing devices that are connected and their usage, as well as what the power supplies in the switch can provide. And what does the switch on each switch port interface actually allow? You will find at times that switches, they might have 48 ports, but only 24 of those ports can actually have PoE provided to them based off of the switch PoE budget. Or maybe only the last eight ports, for example, can do BT, where the rest of them are doing AF and AT. Wouldn't it be nice, Dan, if there's a way that we could test this and see and actually request how much PoE we want and get a verification on this? I thought there's a way we could do that. So there is. If we go into our profile here and we go into settings, you'll see at the top here it says enable PoE and class zero. This other button here, enable true power. So when I enable true power, 
first thing it's going to do is this makes it so that the device is not just checking for the existence of PoE. It is actually going to do a full PoE negotiation for the selected class from this dropdown. So I'm going to go through here and I'm going to select UPoE. By selecting UPoE with Enable True Power, here's what we can specify what our requested power is because you notice that UPoE is a range. You can have devices that can request all the way up to 51 watts. So we can specify in what we want our request power to be. We're going to leave it at 30 here. And we're going to go back now and we're going to look at this auto test again. And we're going to see what it comes up with in terms of the results this time. So you'll see our link is there, but what's missing? We haven't gotten that notification from our PoE test yet. Because remember, again, we are actually doing a full-fledged negotiation in the background for our UPoE. And right there, you can see we got the red danger. Danger, Real Robinson, danger. Here we go. Our requested class was UPoE of 30 watts, but the received class was only 25 and a half watts. So the true power of power that we got ended up being 25.61 watts. That's not enough for us to bring this access point online. So what will happen at this point in time is you can see that we failed our PoE negotiation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your AP is gonna go offline. One of the things that a lot of the vendors have done out there is they have what they call a degraded performance mode on these access points where maybe they won't turn up the 2.4 radio. Maybe only the five gigahertz radio will come on. Maybe they will drop from a four by four to a two by two. You'll have to look at the vendor's data sheets to see what happens in degraded mode. But the importance of this test right here is because if you did not do a true power test, what you would have seen was, okay, the switch is good. Everything is validated. Everything looks fine. I think it looks fine. But in reality, the access point came up, but it's not performing how it should perform. It is going to be underperforming. That's a problem for us. And you're not going to see that unless you look at this from a true power perspective or go into the controller logs and see that the AP is most likely going to have some sort of warning inside of the logs or somewhere that says there's a problem going on with this device. So this so is a this real. Point, yep, go ahead. Sorry, yeah, sorry for interrupting, Blake. So this is kind of like a real hidden issue. If you know, because if you just go through the process of turning up the AP, from one perspective, it's going to look it's all going to look fine. Uh, and even if you're using perhaps a, a, a different type of tester, uh, from our experience, the vast majority of basic link test tools available in the marketplace. They only measure PoE voltage. They don't apply a load. They don't go through the whole negotiation process, and they don't provide the actual drawn power uh, that you can get out of the PSE. So when we're looking at this with less capable tools, it's going to look all, 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 it was all green. It was all green. But the operation of the AP is going to be problematic, and you'll end up spending a lot of time in other other ways and methodologies to try to figure that out. I guess that's kind of like one of the key points here is there's lots of people that manage networks, network infrastructure without a tool like Link Runner G2, but you typically end up spending a lot more time because you end up using a lot more different tools, different data sources, and then you have to kind of correlate all that information in your head uh, as opposed to having it all in this one comprehensive auto test. You're exactly correct. And what this leads us to is this always leads us to this question right here. Are you being proactive or reactive? And we hear this constantly across network engineering. Constantly do we hear about this as proactive versus reactive. One of the goals that I always try to have is I want to be more proactive in everything that I'm doing. And the ways that I can be proactive in everything that I'm doing is if I'm turning up an access point, I'm turning up a network, one of the first things that I'm going to do is I'm going to go around with my tester and I'm plugging in, even if the APs are already plugged in, I'm unplugging them. I'm plugging in the tester, letting it do a full auto test cycle once I've had it defined for the settings that I'm looking for, because that information is then uploaded into the Link Live cloud. With it being up in the cloud, 
I can now report on that and I can look at that and verify all of those parameters against switch port configurations to look for anything that might have been accidentally misconfigured or has some other issues going on. I mean, it, it happens. There's bad cables, there's bad uh, switch port interfaces, you know, things arrive with issues. That's, that's just the way that it goes. Or if you're in a new construction, I've, I've seen it before where we the switch stack is installed long before drywalling is done. And next thing you know, you've got drywall dust all up in your switch ports and you've got poor connectivity because somebody just needs to go through and take a can of compressed air and blow out all the switch ports. So we're trying to figure out ways to be more proactive on this so that we can change this scenario from always being reactive and looking through logs, trying to figure out why are things not performing, become more proactive to look at this and figure out, hey, I saw this, this is the problem, let's fix this before we hit day one. If we can capture it on day zero, that's great. We wanna fix all of that before we get into our day one services. And these types of things that we're looking at here, and we're looking at the, these different scenarios with these handheld testers, this is something that what we are doing, and so this is, a, a, I guess, a partnership, if you will, say with NetAI, where Wi-Fi Academy, one of my organizations that I run, we are developing a handful of courses, no pun intended with the handheld testers there, right? We are developing a handful of courses around the NetILI product suite. And one of the ones that we're launching is the NetILI Link Runner G2 Fundamentals course. And this course is going to cover various topics like this with this type of scenario. So what you just saw here is a subsection of what you're gonna see in the course where we walk through these different types of scenarios, real world scenarios, with the different views from the screens showing you how you can leverage these devices in maybe different ways than what you're used to doing them, but how you can add more value into what you do on a daily basis and be a stronger resource for your customers or for your internal customers, being able to capture all this information. And again, like I said, using the Link Live Cloud to be able to store all that and then pull all that data out when you need it. So you'll be able to get all this information at wifiacademy.net. Um, this is a new offering that we're doing. We've done instructor-led training before. We've done virtual instructor-led training through COVID and prior to that, but now we're launching our on-demand learning. So this is gonna be something that you can do on your own time. You'll have access to all the lab materials, everything. You can go through it at your pace, whether it's quick or whether it takes, you know, goes out over months, it doesn't matter. You'll always have access to the information. Um, so you can get all the information at wifiacademy.net and we also have a coupon code or discount code for 10% off for attendees of the webinar, join Ally. If you are watching this recording a month, two months, three months later down the road and that coupon code is not active anymore, sorry, but at some point in time it might go away. <laughs> act now. <laughs> exact, exactly, act, act now or forever hold, hold your peace, I guess, in, in that regards. But yeah, so we're we're happy to uh, happy to be working with Dan and the team at NetAli to be able to provide some more training around around these devices and like I said, looking at real world use case scenarios of how you leverage these tools and how others are leveraging them out there that maybe you're not familiar with because that's not something that you directly do all the time. It's you know, we see a lot of people in structured cabling, for example, they're they're working their way towards providing more services as this ever-changing landscape and networking has been done, we're, we're looking at completely different workflows for everybody out there. Outstanding. It'll be a very good resource for folks to have. That's what we hope for. Uh, so, Blake, back on to the, uh, did you have something else to go through from this point? Nope. I've got a couple of questions for you. Yep. Um, one, and it, maybe if you could bring up the uh, Link Runner G2's UI again so we can take a look at that. Um, so we, we started out looking at the, the essentials of cable of uh, the auto test. How often do you run into issues with physical layer? Uh, you, we, you, we looked at the scenario of, hey, there was one either non-terminated or broken pair. How often does that actually happen in your experience? You know, it actually happens quite often, and it's not its not a knock against any of the LVCs out there that I work with. A lot of the LVCs that I work with are, are great groups of, of, of engineers. They are engineers in their, in their own ways. And what ends up happening, we see a lot of times, is that there, there runs in these issues with, 
timing on job sites and we've all been there before where something just has to get done or things slip especially with the materials issues that we've had right now where you have to do something before you would normally prefer to do it and then now we've got loose cables that have already been terminated and then comes in the drywallers and the mud gets everywhere mud gets in pins the pins don't get cleaned or dust gets in the switches so it's sadly it happens a lot more often than i would i would wish for it to happen um, but that again is why my first thing is i always i always want to check that regardless of whether it's with the g2 or even you know the other other favorite one that you can carry around is just a ls300 the link sprinter 300 because it's so small and pint size you know it's uh, what what does james say it's the um the double mint gum that fits in your fits in the gum pocket of your jeans if you're wearing jeans and i always want to test something just because i want to rule that out before i start going down it because as network engineers we have a tendency to immediately assume something other than the basic first layer so we will start to troubleshoot and it's irrelevant troubleshooting because a uh, cable is like as we saw it was crimped correctly on six of the eight pins only two pins weren't so it's still going to link up it's still going to give you blinky lights it's just not going to give you the performance you want right because we're you know we can get 100 meg over over two pairs uh but you're not going to get the gig and another follow-up questions come in okay so in this particular scenario um the switch is under provisioning uh power what could be the cause of that could that be a misconfiguration of the switch or could it be that the power budget's been exceeded, what what would the next step be in trying to go down this path of solving the PoE issue? Yeah, so the first step that I do on the on the PoE issue is I'm always gonna log into the switch and there's usually, it varies on the manufacturers, but what you wanna do is you wanna look for the command that allows you to see what the switch PoE budget is, what the used versus allowed is, um, you can sometimes do the math based off of just looking at the PSU, what the the power sourcing unit for the switch provides in terms of wattage. You know, if it provides 400 watt PSU, you can somewhat do some of the math to figure out what your switch port capabilities are going to be if you take out the overhead of just running the switch itself. But there's usually a command, or now that we're you know the cloud, everything is the cloud. Um, there's going to be a management platform that we can look at and see how much of the PoE is been utilized versus what is allowed based off of the power supply configurations. Because one thing to take into consideration on this as well is, if you've got redundant power supplies, like say for example, on a Cisco switch stack, if you have them stacked and you also have the PSUs stacked, you can do stack-wise power on those, your switch that you're physically plugged into could be sourcing power from another switch that had available power that could be allocated down onto that one. So then that also opens up Pandora's box in terms of, well, now I have to look at this and take this in consideration in terms of if this switch fails, how much of that PoE was actually being used by this switch down here at the bottom of the stack that has an underutilized PSU, it has a smaller wattage PSU as opposed to the one on top. Like you might only have two of them that have redundant 750 watt power supplies and the rest of them don't, and you're expecting that stack-wise power to be evenly distributed in the event of a failure, if it fails with the one that has the 750 watt, that causes another issue. So always go into the switch interface and look at and see what is the used budget versus the allowed budget, and you'll be able to get that answer as to, all right, what do I need to look at here? It might just be that you have too many devices plugged in. Now also, it's important to remember because of the classes, a device can request a higher class than what it's actually gonna use. So things like Microsoft Teams phones, they're only gonna use a couple watts, but they might request 15 watts or 12 and a half watts. Oh. And that comes out of the budget, even though it's only using three watts. Gotcha, so note to self, uh, watch switch PoE budgets carefully. Exactly, and especially as you're starting to look at and evaluate Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6 E access points, it's extremely important to look at the appropriate switch PoE budgets, not just from the cabling side of it, do I have older cable standards that not going to support it, but also what can your switch handle? 
Gotcha. Gotcha. Excellent. Thanks for, for digging into that. So I guess one of the, uh, kind of coming back to the, one of the uh, conclusions here, and as I kind of pointed out earlier, we've got a lot of different ways that we can look at this information. Uh, you mentioned, you know, sure, I can capture some traffic with my laptop uh, and uh, you know, do some frame decode to take a look at those DHCP options. I can uh, look into switch interface UIs. I can use basic PoE testers. I can use basic cable testers. Um, and all of that works. Um, but I think one of the conclusions here is you know, the, the, the time factor of get me the information I need to solve this problem quickly uh, is kind of why we developed this auto test feature in most of our products. So that we're going to pack all of that information into one go uh, so that you don't have to rely on using a multiple multiple tool. Has that been your experience that um, you, you can MacGyver your way out of these issues using uh, <laughs> duct tape and, and uh, paper clips, but uh, having a dedicated tool has always been better for you? Yeah, exactly. Having having this one handheld device that that does all of that, you know, at least from that initial round of troubleshooting, getting me the information that I need, it it's invaluable for me. There's so much you can do. So, and there was actually just a Twitter thread. Uh, a couple of us were were talking about this in terms of, you know, just the physical reliability of these things. The fact that they have a cushioned case around them. I mean, you can you can drop them out a scissors list when you're in warehouses, and you're checking the cables up top. They don't break. I've I've tossed them across training room floors, on accident to prove a point before that they are they are reliable, and it's it's such an easier device to hold and work with than your laptop or even a phone or a tablet. They're the reliability of them, the fact that I, I know that it, it works, it boots up so quickly. You saw how quickly we got all that information once I physically actually connected the cable to it. I mean, once once you're doing the test, within a matter of, was that less than 30 seconds, even for the PoE um, true power test, we have basically all the information that we need to about that port and all that information is also uploaded into Link Live where I have access to that data that I can then run reports off of, get CSV exports, you know, get the data out of there so that I can put that into my own reports to show that, yeah, this is the state of what the ports were when we did our testing. Now come day one, day two, if things aren't working and switch port interfaces have been changed, you've got that verification that, well, it was done correctly at one point in time. Who made a change? Get a little bit of an yeah, yeah, that was actually, a, 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 I'm glad you brought that up again. Um, you, you did mention that fairly quickly before, but a, a in terms of being proactive versus reactive again, uh, the idea about logging your test results for future reference, uh, and you just referred to it again there, the, the, how the tools work with Link Live. And for those who, who are on the call perhaps that don't know, uh, so Link Live is a cloud service that NetAlly offers basically comes free with every test instrument. Whenever you run an auto test like that, that those results are automatically uploaded to that cloud service. So now you have a, a permanent record uh, of those test results. They're sortable, organizable, searchable, uh, and great, thank you for bringing that up. Maybe you can do a real quick show of what those test results look like when we're doing them in Link Live. Sorry, Blake, if you're talking, I'm not hearing you, but... Uh... Yep, sorry about that. Okay. There you go. <laughs> when I, when I'm mute, hey, hey, like we were joking at the beginning of this, you know, it's we're two years into this, we would have this mute button figured out by now, but um, <laughs> here, here's the test results that you can see here. Uh, it failed. Why did it fail? Again, common, common things from the color schemes of red is there, so that you can see that. It failed based off of the unloaded versus the loaded PoE. Uh, we did not get our, our negotiation on there. Our previous results that did fail, or did work, excuse me, because we weren't doing loaded. We were just leaving it as an unloaded in there. So all of our information is right in here. 
DHCP addresses. So we can always, we can step back through this entire process here where we started our, our morning off here and we can look at this and we can see here and say, okay, DHCP, we got the dot .10 address as opposed to the dot .1110 address, VLAN one. So then we go into our first fix after that was we fixed DHCP. So there we got our, our correct DHCP address, but it still doesn't have the option 43 information in there. Now you can see up in this test result, VLAN 110 were correct. 130 as well as our, or excuse me, 110 with our IP address and our option 43 of 130.20 was correct in there. And then that, because I, well, I, was, I switched the profile over to the Cisco uh, DHCP profile, then we're switching to the PoE. You can even see here that it says what profile that you were leveraging for your testing in there. The little asterisk means I have a change in there that was not saved. That was me enabling true power on it. So you, we have all that information in there that we can then go through and say, I want to try to check these on my iPad here. And I either want to add a label to it that says what this job site was, or I can go through and I can say I want to add all that stuff to an album for later for using on reporting, delete them, whatever the case might be. If I want to, I can click the floating action button, the fab button down here, and you can see I can click a generate PDF here. I want to get those, I want to include images in there, and it'll generate in the background now. Is going to generate my report which might take a couple of minutes depending on how much how much information that you have in there but then you will see that available in your files uh, february 16th that is today you can see that we're still processing so it's still working on creating that report for us but we'll be able to see it you can look at it and say i want to be able to see what the results are that were associated with just this report so here's those uh, results that we were leveraging for this report that we're trying to create on that screen if you would Sorry, uh, go back to a results page. So yep. if you scroll down um, in the results, so right there, uh, just wanted to point out that attachments window. Um, one thing that uh, Link Corner G2 actually brings to the party, which is very handy, there is a camera on the back of the unit. Uh, so you're actually able to take photographs when you're out troubleshooting uh, or installing, validating, whatever you're doing. When you run these auto tests, if you wanted to take a photograph of like an asset tag uh, or the physical location of that AP, you know, you know, looking up in a conference room, I'm looking up at the corner of the room and I see an AP installed up in the corner. I can take a picture of that and attach that to the test result uh, or of a wall jack. It, it, you know, there's you know, a lot of different ways that this, the ability to add an image uh, can actually aid in documentation uh, and being proactive, and as you saw when Blake was pulling the uh, uh, the report together, you have the option to add those images to the report as well. So, uh, another great way of doing documentation. Uh, if there are any other questions, please feel free to, to ask ask them in at this point. Um, I think we're getting close to wrapping up, so if there's any questions, we'll address those. If not, Blake, anything else that you had that uh, you wanted to wrap up with? No, I literally was just working on. Oh, there we go. <laughs> hey, in real time, that's what it's like. I was just working on putting putting that up there so that you can see. So here is our results. Again, this is the page that we that we Dan was just talking about, and now you can see that there is the photo attached to that result that I went ahead and added. Um, maybe just tell the, uh, tell the audience the process that you went through to do so. Yeah, well, why, why tell? And we can go back to there. So again, the floating action button or the fab button down on the bottom here, we can add a picture, we can add a comment. So I went through and I just I did add, add picture, opened up the camera to, to go through and, and grab it. And then once you take a photo, then you go back to it and it becomes available. You select it. So, you know, we can do whatever we want here, we'll add that one to this result as well. Go through here and say add a comment. Not enough power. Go ahead and add that comment. So then if we go back over to here, 
it already updated the screen for me. You can see here that we got our new one in there, and we also got a comment up here, which shows up as this little tag bubble up here, not enough power. Oh, yeah. Then we could filter on those comments. So that's one of the things about comments is, if you use it as just say a job site, like I'm at XYZ customer job site, you can then filter all those and our report did finish so we we created that we might as well show that real quick here too so here's our our reports the because we added in that we want to see all the images and everything you can see errors for 20 percent of the time success rate was 80 percent of the time what switches do we see imagine that if you have this where you're doing this as an entire building you know, you'd see all the different switches that you're connected to. You kind of get an idea of what your load is across of across them in terms of PoE ports of, for where your APs are plugged into, your network IPs, your VLANs, and then we start to see all of our all of our test results are all included in here. So you can easily add this to your documentation that says to your as built documentation that says, yeah, I I went through and I tested all of these. This is this is what I saw. It's all been documented and verified. That documentation is something that we all hate doing as as engineers or network architects. This makes it so much easier to do because we got all that information there and it's just dropping the pages in and, and now we've got all that information. All automated, yeah. A uh, couple other questions have come in. Um, one, can you give some tips or information on fiber testing? And that's something we didn't really touch on here. Uh, the Link Runner G2 uh, does have an SFP cage slot port on it uh, so that you can put effectively any type of SFP into the uh, tester. Uh, you get basic um, uh, power and loss measurements uh, and the ability to set a reference uh, with that. And it's like putting in the, uh, the SFP now. Yep, trying to get them in the right way there. And uh, then we can test a fiber link with that. So effectively, the, the oh, hey, in real time even, look at that. Uh, here's the question is, do I actually have that hooked up to anything? <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure the tester will let you know. But of sure. course, yep, there we go. Of course, we're going to miss the, uh, uh, you know, the, the copper related uh, test function. Um, there but you there go. you go, right on. <laughs> uh, after there's one gig, full duplex, uh, gives us the type, the vendor, version, the model, uh, our received power, and the rest of the link tests complete as uh, before. Yep. Right on. So the same kind of uh, functionality in auto test, whether you're on copper or fiber, once we get above that physical layer test. And again, uh, and another question was, we're, we're, sometimes we use the, the terminology G2 uh, generically, but uh, yes, we have two G2 products in the NetAlly family. One is the LinkRunner G2, uh, which is a uh, dedicated wired uh, Ethernet test instrument, and the AirCheck G2, uh, which, has a, uh, which is a wireless Wi-Fi test tool. Uh, interestingly, both products can have some capability or do have some capability for the other media. Uh, the AirCheck does have an RJ45 port for doing um, essential basic link testing, kind of link sprinter like link testing. Uh, LinkRunner G2, uh, uh, and uh, Blake, if you could hold up the top of the instrument one more time to the camera. Uh, there is a USB A port uh, there on the top of the unit. You can add an aftermarket. Well, look, you, you just, you're, you're anticipating everything I'm going to ask here. Uh, so there's a little Edimax um, Wi-Fi adapter. Um, as Blake pointed out, this is an Android instrument, and on the Link Live Play Store that we have, or the curated app store, uh, you can load some of the basic um, Wi-Fi analysis apps. Uh, of course, not they don't provide the level of detail that you can with a dedicated test instrument like AirCheck. But at least you've got an instrument now that gives you some of that visibility of Wi-Fi uh, when you're out there uh, uh, doing the uh, typical copper or fiber link testing. Um, so you can see Blake is able to just call up those apps. We've got some other customers that run their trouble ticketing apps on the product. So when they're out at the desktop, out solving problems, when the problem's been resolved, 
uh, they can close the ticket from the test instrument itself. And that also provides network connectivity uh, for the instrument uh, while you're out there. If the testing that you're doing is uh, does not have internet access, chances are your Wi-Fi network might give that to you. So there we go. And of course, that's going to be the one demo that does not work. Hey, we are doing pretty good though on the uh, on the fly demos. So far, so good. Yeah. Well, hey, Blake, um, I think that wraps it up for us. Thank you so much for your time and effort to put the presentation together, and and also for creating the Link Runner uh, G2 courseware. And uh, we'll we'll certainly include a link to your website. Uh, I believe you said it was WiFiAcademy.net. That is correct. Okay, so folks can, can go out there to look for that course in which you're going to run through all of the tips and tricks of using Link Runner G2 from uh, top to bottom. Any last uh, comments? No, just a pleasure being here, and I uh, hope everybody found it uh, informational and got some good knowledge out of there, and uh, look forward to seeing you, seeing you on future webinars. Right on. Thanks a lot, Blake, and, and everyone, thank you so much for joining us on this webinar, whether you're here live or on the recorded. This now concludes our event today. Have a great day. Bye-bye.